All right, guys, we're going to go live in like two seconds. Let me get this uh, questions in there. And um, feel free to drop questions, guys, in the question mark box, comment box, or wherever at the bottom. Um, I'm going to get this set up, and we will get rolling. I want to focus on the left-hand side of the screen first, and we will get to the right-hand side of the screen. So make sure this doesn't fall over on me. We should be good to go. Looks like you guys can see. Um, feel free to ask questions, guys, in the comment box and question mark box. We are talking tonight specifically about investment allocations. Um, and I will get up here and start talking about it. All right, so when investment allocations, we need to understand what stage of the game this comes into play. Because the biggest thing when it comes to finance and saving money and investing is your savings rate. This conversation does not even start at that point in time. We want to make sure that we're just saving a lot of money. We have a portion of our paycheck that is going to our savings account or investment accounts um, based on our goals. And there's a dedicated portion that's automated that's going there. Because most people don't get past that stage. They don't even have money to invest or they aren't even you know, um, taking the time to prioritize a savings account. And so therefore, they don't even get to this conversation because all their money is going to spend and give, give the bank. So once you get to the point of now we're saving money, it's automated, and now we need to invest that money. We're not just saving money, we're saving to invest. So they've, they've obviously dedicated a savings rate, but now a portion of that or the vast majority of their savings is going to investments. Now then this conversation comes into play. This is where it becomes relevant to the everyday person trying to build wealth and how to allocate properly within your investment accounts. So before we even get started in the, in the nuance and you know, complicated stuff, guys, let's start here. Let's ask yourself, the very first thing I want you to do is just ask yourself, are you a risk-seeking individual or are you a risk-neutral individual or are you risk-averse? And so the way I usually get to this answer is to ask a few questions, right? So first things first is if you go back to March of 2020, how are you in that situation, you know, treating the market? Um, how are you reacting to the market? What was going on in your brain, um, in your stomach? Were you freaking out and trying to sell everything or were you pretty good? Um, or were you like, oh my God, let's buy more. Let's keep, you know, buying the dip or, um, of course we're dollar cost averaging into the dip, but what kind of um, makeup it, uh, did you have going on at that point in time with your behavior in particular? So behavior type, risk-seeking, risk-neutral, risk-averse. Another question to ask yourself is like more practical everyday questions. So I always say like put yourself in actual scenarios where like there's risk at play. And I'm serious when I say this, but what if somebody broke into your house and um, how would you react? Would you like go like knock that dude out or would you like kind of take a step back, like assess the situation, would you be more risk neutral or would you be hiding in the corner trying to hide and not make any contact? Or let's say you're out in public and somebody makes a really rude comment to your, your spouse. How do you react in that situation? That kind of is a more practical approach to kind of see what type of person you are. You likely, if you know yourself pretty well, you know kind of which bucket you fall into. This is a very broad seeking bucket, but you kind of know where you fall into from a behavior type. So that's step one to figuring out your investment allocations. You just have to understand what type of person you are because the way you react to these situations or how you're going to react to a, a stock market, um, either when it's going up or when it's going down or when it's just kind of flat in the middle. So you have to understand kind of the person that you are behind the actual money or the spreadsheet that we're looking at. So once we get to the behavior type, we kind of put our buckets. Now we want to jump over to what is our goal? What are we trying to accomplish with our actual investment accounts? So before we actually get to the allocations within our investment accounts, remember you have to select your investments within the actual investment account. That is a very commonly, um, something that's very, a common misconception. So let's, let me restate that. You have to select your investment allocation within in your account, okay? So I'm gonna pause there because that's a very, very important concept because most people are investing in their 401k and they have no idea that you have to invest the allocation within your 401k. They just tell me, hey, my 401k sucks. 
uh, it's down in the market. I say, what are you investing in? They say the 401k. That's not, that's not even a thing. So you have to select your allocation within that account. So the very first thing is we have to understand what's our goal. So before we can even select the account, this is kind of before the allocations, right? Before we can select our actual account, we have to know what our goal is. If you, if you meet with any financial professional, before they kind of start giving you a detailed plan, they're going to ask you, what are your goals? What are you trying to accomplish in life? Just in general. Just talk out loud, talk you know, practical to me. Are you trying to figure out retirement? Are you trying to figure out college? Are you trying to figure out home down payment? So many co- you know, common um, types of goals that people have out there. So time horizon is going to be a very important factor to this, right? So once you kind of get to your goals, you can kind of start to, to figure out which accounts you're going to be working within. So, you know, if you're going to go to retirement, well, likely an IRA, likely a 401k, and likely maybe a taxable brokerage as part of that. Obviously, we've talked about this in detail before, so I'm not going to get into too much detail about how you get to the goals and accounts and all that kind of stuff. Then you got to know what broker to, to select. Are you going to go with like a Vanguard? Are you going to go with a Fidelity? Are you going to go with a Charles Schwab? The, the people that house your investments. And the reason I'm bringing these things up before I get to the allocation piece of it is because these have to be determined before you know your investment allocations. I don't know how many times I get in a given day and say, hey, should I invest in a 401k or should I invest in the stock market? That question makes me cringe for multiple reasons. And I'm not being rude about it. I'm just saying it's a core misunderstanding of how investments work. And it's almost like I got to start from the beginning and it's hard to give a direct answer. I can't say either or because it wouldn't make sense. So understanding these things come before the actual allocations. Now, once you get the allocation or sorry, once you get to the account, you know your goals, you know which account you're selecting and you also know where you're going to house your money. Now we have to select our investments. We've Let's say we've, we've dedicated $500 to our IRA and that's going to be automated every single month into my IRA. But where are those being, where's that $500 going within that account? Because what happens, and this is going to save a lot of people on the slide, probably a lot of money is, or somebody that you guys know, is if you don't select these, it's going to default to cash. Literally the same thing as your bank account. So you're not investing money. You can open an IRA, but if it's going to a money market account, you're not actually investing money, whether you put it there or not. So you have to invest once it's within there. And you have to dedicate exactly where those, those allocations are going. Okay, so second thing is up here. Investor allocation quizzes. So I have two investor alloc- allocation quizzes in particular on my YouTube video that says, um, it's, it's, it t- talks about this topic, but I have Vanguard, I have um, Fidelity, I have Charles Schwab, and I also have JP Morgan, I believe, or maybe... Um, one other one, but there's like four different one options that you guys can take. Everybody needs to take these. You have to understand what you're trying to accomplish. And it kind of gives you a set of questions to tell what your behavior type is, what type of allocations you should kind of model your portfolio after. And this gives you like a base model. So now that you know kind of where you fall and you know your goals and kind of which a broker you're going to work with, the next question or the next thing step you want to take is take some investor allocation quizzes out there. Is this going to answer your question precisely? No, but this is going to give you a good model and a good base as to where you should start. Um, Let me make sure you guys can see all that over there. So um, scroll that way a little bit. Okay. So once you get to the investor allocation quizzes, you're going to, they're going to like literally give you a model portfolio. It's going to be a cookie cutter portfolio. Okay. So it might say like 75% stocks, 10%, uh, real estate, you know, 15% bonds. I don't know. It's, it's going to tell you commodities. It's going to tell you a little bit of cash, but it's going to basically take the five asset classes for the majority, you know, the typical five asset classes. And it's going to craft a percentage for each of those based on what you've answered. So this will give you a good model. Again, that's, it's not like kind of a, a precise answer, but it's going to give you a pretty good like starting point so that you're not way out in left field. You kind of have an idea. Okay. So number three, once you get that, Number four is let's make the changes and let's monitor the ongoing activity. So I want to say and really stop here and and talk about this, this point in particular, because when you're making those changes, you're doing it one time and you're automating that process. So you're going to say, let's say you can't, you come to the um, conclusion, let's just say an easy allocation, right? 70, 30 stocks, bonds. Okay. So you go to this, this easy allocation you set this up automatically. You make the changes one time. 
Now we have to on ongoing, like on a on a per maybe annual basis, the actual activity that's happening. Because if you start off in your 70 30 and the market shifts, right, and now all of a sudden you're 60 40, you might want to have to you at that point in time you have to rebalance. So rebalancing is down here, and I talk about that in, in particular. So when you rebalance, there's th some things to consider to that. So this is not an exception or an excuse to just like change your allocations every second the, the, the move or the market moves because like right now, as you see the market's dipping. So this is not the time to like all of a sudden just change everything because you're freaking out and panicking. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm saying let's select a day, let's make this a recurring thing on our calendar and let's rebalance to make sure we're not way out of whack. And if we're one to two to three percent off, like it doesn't necessarily mean you have to rebalance. Like we want to be as strategic with this. We don't want to like wreck our portfolio with this or make like brat, like really, really crazy changes just because like we're not comfortable with the market. This isn't where we change our allocations. We are not changing our allocations at that point in time. So most people are going to tell themselves or they're going to emotionally tell themselves you know what? The market sucks. I need, I, I think I should go this strategy instead. I'm going to change my allocations. That's not what I'm talking about. This is rebalancing to your original position because this is the allocation that you've concluded on based on steps one, two, and three, and so, and so on and so forth. So you've come to this conclusion. We're not panicking here, but we're rebalancing two different equations. If you were doing this in a retirement account, you could sell really quickly and it can make you, you could do it really simply without tax penalty. If you are doing this into in a taxable or a taxable brokerage account or a non-retirement account, you have to be very careful because there's tax penalties associated with it, short-term capital gains. If you are buying and selling different things to rebalance, you're going to get hit with tax penalties. So you've got to be aware of that. That's not the only way to do it. And I probably wouldn't do it that way. I would probably shift the, on the, the future contributions. You have your current allocations, shift your future contributions to then kind of get you back to where you were. You don't have to do this overnight. Like this doesn't have to happen like tomorrow. You can take your time over a little bit of time to kind of rebalance yourself. You don't have to freak out and do it like overnight and get tax penalty. If you are uneasy about doing this, if you have no idea what I'm talking about right now, I would consider a financial advisor. And I am not a financial advisor, I am a CPA. And I often say you do not need a financial advisor. I typically will say, you don't need a financial advisor, okay? But if you are not sure what I'm talking about or this might intimidate you or you think you're gonna emotionally make the wrong decision, a financial advisor can make a lot of sense. Now, they are gonna come with a hefty fee. That's just the reality of the, of the business. You're gonna pay them a fee, but you have to ask yourself and, and be realistic with yourself, is paying them that fee a net positive or a net negative? If you know what you're doing, you're not emotionally attached and you set this up all to be automated, you probably are going to have a net negative if you hire a financial advisor, just the reality of it. Um, and this isn't a shot at any financial advisors. They A lot of financial advisors provide other great values in their fees. And so this isn't a debate on whether you should have a financial advisor or not. But if you have zero clue and you're going to panic sell right now in the most opportune time to buy then just get a financial advisor because they're going to save you so much money on panic selling and just making bad ultimate de decisions. Okay. So that's kind of my take on financial advisors. I have a YouTube video on what factors to consider when, when using a financial advisor. All right. So you guys got to kind of got the process, right? The, the steps to kind of go to your investment allocations. Now I want to go back over to um, this side a little bit on the left hand side to kind of cover the investment goals. Okay, so depending on your investment goals, right? When you go to do these investor allocation quizzes, a lot of times what they're going to say is um, they're going to give you kind of like a, um, you're going to have to select what your goals are. And it's, it's going to give you like three options typically. Income, do you want to be balanced? Do you want to be growth oriented? Um, and it will say like in Vanguard and stuff when you set up your accounts, like it will usually give you, gives you these three options. What do these mean in a nutshell? It's really simple. 70 to 100% bond allocation if you select an income-based portfolio, right? These are fixed income payments from bonds. So when someone says income portfolio, they're referring to bond funds primarily that are paying you fixed income payments every single um, um, payout, right? Now, 
balanced is kind of a mix of both, obviously. 40, 60 stocks and obviously the reverse of the other assets. Now growth is primarily, obviously, stocks. So you're trying to grow your portfolio. There's nothing wrong with any of these options, right? But you have to understand your other goals and how these investment goals link to these other goals up here. Because this type of goal, if you're trying to save for retirement and you're in an income-based portfolio at the age of 23 years old, good luck. That's a really bad decision. So you don't. You want to make sure these are linked to these other goals, and they have to have some risk reward with that. You have to understand the volatility that comes with each one of these types of portfolios. So that's very important to understand. If you are thinking, I'm going to jump right here um, in the middle, right? So if you're thinking like, well, shoot, like I don't know my allocations. I'm trying to, you know, obviously you walk through all these steps and you kind of have somewhat of an idea. But let's just, I'm going to share a really crazy stat. So if you were like, shit, I'm just going to go with like 100% like bonds or 100% uh, stocks. Like what's the outcome based on historical data? So Vanguard conducted a study from 1926 to 2018 that that's about a 93 year period if I did math right. Um, so the um, if you were 100% bonds in particular, you would have a 5.3% return. This is historically speaking. Remember, the market's changed, but historically speaking, that's what it is. The highest year would be 32.6%. The lowest year would be negative 8.1%. So those would be your that that would be kind of your returns if you were 100% bonds. Obviously, every period is a lot different. If you were 100% stocks during that period you would have a 10.1% average, double that, and then you would also have a high of 54.2% and a low of 43.1%. So what do I gather from this data? My, my thoughts are the, the deviation from like, um, from the 32 to eight is like, a, it's obviously a lot smaller than a, a, the wide gap of 54%, but also 43%. So therefore, the, the higher, the, the riskier you wanna get, the more stock you wanna go, the less risky you want to get, the, obviously, the bonds, right? So of the 93 years, 14 years of those were losses for bonds, and 26 years of stocks were losses. So obviously, stocks have a lot more volatility, and therefore, if you're trying to grow your portfolio, there's a risk associated with that. But in order to keep up with a long-term outlook like of a retirement goal, that's okay. It's not the biggest of deals. However, you realize the stock market does not do this, obviously. Um, the stock market does this and this and, and that and that and all of a sudden when you get the average It kind of looks like a pretty smooth average, but Over the long haul you just don't know and so if you're jumping into the market right now It might be really scary to see the market down, but this is a good thing because if you're a long-term buyer and your dollar cost averaging on the way up and on the way down You're buying more per share every single time you put your dollars in the market right now so when it comes back, which it will, because the U.S. stock market has U.S. businesses with us, your mom, your dad, you, me, operating and building revenues for these businesses, they will naturally go back up, okay? And so if you catch it on the downswing, you're buying on a sale, and that's a good thing. A lot of people see it differently, and they think this is the time to sell, and that's why you get average returns, which are horrendous compared to market average returns. The average investor from 2001, here, this is from 2001 to 2020, the average investor returned three point, I think it was like 3.6%. That's awful. That is horrendous. It's because they don't have these things set up and, and they don't have it set themselves up from an investment allocation perspective. And all of a sudden they see these big dips, they sell, then they go to a financial advisor and they're, they pick the wrong financial advisor and that advisor is charging them front load fees and back end, you know, back load fees, and they put themselves in miserable positions. Whereas the market, if you were just the S and P five hundred and you did nothing, you automated this process and you did nothing, it would be about nine point five percent. So about let's just say roughly three x is if you were just in low cost index funds, you just dollar cost average and you touched nothing from two thousand one to two thousand twenty, about. 3x roughly, right? So the point is, is obviously you need to be diversified. You need to go through this, these steps I talk about to get to your proper allocations. You need to reassess these allocations from time to time. You can't just blindly do this and select it one time at 23 and say, oh, I'm good for life. Um, this will change. This will change with time. Absolutely will change. 
So, okay, so down here, guys, some rules of thumbs to think about through this. So, so there's a few of them, right? A very broad rule of thumb is 120 minus your age equals your stock allocation. So 120 minus your age, let's say I'm 30 years old, would be about 90% stock allocation. That difference would be 10% into other assets. That applies to not every account, but if you're looking at like a retirement account, this would apply. If you're looking at like a 529 account, that would make no sense, right? Because age is irrelevant for your 529. You want to think in terms of when do you need the money for these specific accounts? If I need a broker, if I need, if I'm investing in a brokerage and I need it in six or seven years, this would not make a lot of sense. So think about when you need that money. Um, do not sell prematurely. Like I'm going to circle this one, like, like extreme because like, this is like the most important, like, like if I can just like circle that a million times, like I'm going to do that. Like star, 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 because right now I didn't think I'd see it, but I am. Um, everyone's telling me they should sell. They're telling me that the world's going to end. The market sucks. Like all these types of crazy doom and gloom stories. As much education as I, I've read in my past, as much stuff as, you know as I've done in my past, one thing I haven't done was experience a really bad market. Besides March 2020, just based on my age, right? I'm 30 years old, and I haven't been around investing since 08 because I was in high school at that point in time. So I didn't really see or talk to people in high school investing and selling prematurely. But that's all I read about in books and um, talked to other professionals out there is like, when there's a bad market, all the uneducated people will start selling selling prematurely. There will be smart people selling prematurely, thinking they're they're beating the market or shorting the market, and they know what they're doing. The reality is they're just going to get shit returns, and it's going to be three point six percent. That's just the reality of it. Um, so do not sell pre prematurely. Set up your allocations, and this is a long game. Now we might want to re reassess allocations, but we don't want to prematurely do anything. We want to make sure we know exactly when these accounts are going to be pulled and set ourselves up for success long term. The other thing you can do is one to five index funds or ETFs in a portfolio. So if you're trying to get to these allocations and you ultimately need to select indexes or ETFs to do that, therefore, just do one to five. Do not complicate this. Do not select 28 stocks or 28 individual stocks. That's just pointless. Um, you're not going to get anywhere with that. And your better bet is just to do a very simple portfolio structure. And we'll walk through an example in a second as to how to do that. One to five index funds. Dividend reinvestment. This needs to be automatically set up. Most accounts, if you're like Vanguard, these are automatically set up. Um, I did a post the other night that would reinvest those dividends. Um, I showed you how I, you know, what I do and stuff like that to when I got Q3 dividends from like one of my accounts. It's always reinvested. That is never going to cash. You need to ensure that the, your money in your individual holdings or your ETFs, index funds are being reinvested. Um, and automate this process. Like automate, automate, automate. Do not manually do any of this. This is stupid to do manually. We're all human. We all make mistakes and just be aware of that. So just automate this process and make it very, very simple. Once you set it up, you don't have to continually look at this every single day or you'll drive yourself crazy. Um, I don't touch any of my investments. I do zero with my investments on a daily basis. I don't stare at the stock market. I don't care what the stock market does because I've walked through the educational steps here to make sure I feel very confident with what's going on. It does not scare me at all. Um, the biggest thing, guys, is as long as you guys have a, a hefty cash cash position in, the, in a down market, um, and not hefty, but you have an emergency fund f funded, you have your checking funded, and you don't lose a job, or you don't have like a a scare in, in income or cash flow type type vehicle, you're going to be fine. There's no reason to sell. Um, okay, let me take you over here. So I'm going to take you to the far right. All right, so let me make sure this doesn't fall. Okay, there we go. So in the far right, guys, are three different fund examples. So if you guys want to go through say actual examples of actual ticker symbols, right? You could do like really simple approach here, right? You could do a one fund portfolio. You could do a two fund portfolio. You could do a three fund portfolio, so on and so forth. But that's kind of back to the one to five index funds. So if you're with Vanguard and you're like, hey, I just want to do like a really, really simple portfolio. If I do a one fund portfolio, I want to make sure I have a lot of asset classes, a lot of exposure to a lot of different areas. I'm not a fan of a one fund. I'm not a fan of target date funds. But if you wanted to do this and you just wanted to keep it simple, I'm not opposed to doing something like VFFVX. That's not investment advice. 
That's dependent on your age as well, so you gotta be very aware of that. Target date funds are when you actually are gonna pull that money. You're not you're not limited to those dates, but like that's 2055, so that's like when I would retire, technically speaking. Uh, so target date fund would be like one fund. If you want to go like two funds, um, you could do a total world stock market index, like a VTWAX, and then you could also do a VBTLX, which would be like a bond fund as well. So really simple approach there. Um, you know, whichever allocations you decide ultimately just between those two funds. And then a three fund approach would be like kind of like a VT wax in a sense um, between VTSAX and VTIX and then VBTLX, which would be a bond fund as well. Um, so that could be a three fund portfolio option through Vanguard. Vanguard, not Fidelity, not Charles Schwab, Vanguard. Um, you would not use those specific funds if you were operating somewhere else, but that's a Vanguard example. And then lastly, guys, um, before I field some questions, is let's take an example. Let's use an example, okay? So let's say we have an example of a 30-year. I'm just going to use my, my analytics based on my, my Instagram insights. So let's say we have a 30-year-old that's looking to do an aggressive growth IRA, and they are looking for international exposure and broad, you know, broad uh, universal exposure, okay? So if somebody was that in that situation you would think back to the investment goals over here, right? Your growth is 70 to 100% stocks. So therefore, in order to get to this goal, this investment goal and with, in line with what their goals are, which is the retirement, how do they actually go about doing that? So the very first step they would do is obviously, you know, walk through all of the, all of this stuff I've talked about tonight, um, but ultimately this is their conclusion. So they would get a total US market fund of about 60% exposure, they would have about total international of 15%, and then they would have a real estate exposure of 10%, small cap value of 10%, and then US bond of 5%. So what does that kind of sum up to, right? There's five index funds, so one to five index funds. They've now linked growth to their goals. They know what their goals are. They understand where their behavior type is. So they understand from an investor allocation where they should be primarily. And they understand the conclusion is stocks of 85%, real estate of 10%, and bonds of 5%. So if you looked into growth of 70 to 100% in stocks, they've accomplished that investment goal, and that's in line with this ultimately. And now they feel confident to automate this process. So they're not gonna, once they kind of got those funds with whatever broker they're with, now they're gonna go automate this process. They're gonna set up automatic contributions and they're not gonna do anything. And they're gonna re they're gonna rebalance maybe once a year if if needed, and that's it. So that's the ultimate conclusion. And so a lot of times we start when uh, people ask me questions, I'll, I'll say, you know, X, Y, and Z or whatever. I kind of give them this this conclusion, but this is all the back end work that you have to do to get to that conclusion, and ultimately that's left out quite a bit. So um, that's my presentation to you guys tonight on uh, investment allocations. I'm gonna flip this around and answer some questions and. Um, try to answer everything I can, guys. All right, so. And guys, you guys want to see my production? This is my production. I'm dead serious. Look at this. This is a, um, right now we are in the process of like updating rooms and stuff like that. So this is like the reality of our um, house right now in this like bedroom slash like work room. But my lighting is awful, so I'm trying to work on lighting to get better. But we have some plans here soon, so it will make a lot of sense. All right, so let's see, let's see. All right. all right, let's go to the very top, and let's answer all and any questions that you guys have. Um, thank you. Appreciate you guys. Thank you for the comment. Um, I'm scrolling down, guys. There's a lot of people that joined. Uh, All right. So there's financial consultants that provide financial planning and investment management complimentary. It may be worth making that known to your audience. Yeah, there's there's a lot of different financial professionals out there for sure. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Sorry guys, there's a lot of people that joined. Feel, feel free to drop questions below guys as I scroll through this, these uh, 
Uh, questions. Okay. Why don't I like target date funds seem easier or just use them through Vanguard? Um, so I don't like target date funds one because you are, it depends which account you're using them in. If you're using them in a taxable account, they have some bond exposure. So that could be, you know, not tax favorable. If you're using them in a, uh, a retirement account, like a uh, 401k or something like that for a target date fund through Vanguard, they're fine. But the problem is they're really, really conservative for me and they're not to my my uh, my investment goals right here on this list right here. So I don't personally like that. You lose control of allocations. You don't select any allocations. Um, the fees typically are a little higher than a standard index fund like a broad-based index fund. Vanguard's are pretty low. So Vanguard's dropped their funds last year to like eight basis points for the most part. So they should be fine from a fee standpoint. Vanguard's good with all that kind of stuff, but I'd be kind of careful with other target date funds. I've seen things high as like 40 basis points, which are ridiculous um, for something as simple as that. So I like to control my allocations and um, I don't like to pay the fees associated with them. And also with a taxable account, it could be detrimental from a tax perspective. Um, please save this live. Yeah, guys, every single Wednesday, Whiteboard Wednesday, we talk about a topic. If you guys want me to talk about a specific topic, please go to the comment box or question mark box and drop com or drop topics that you guys want me to discuss. I don't just make these up. I listen to you guys. I hear what you guys say, and I go do a presentation on a specific topic. So this is you guys. Um, whatever you guys want to hear, just drop ideas in the bottom. Um, this is awesome. Great job. Appreciate you, man. Thank you. Uh, clean light setup. <laughs> yeah, my, my light setup, guys, is not there yet. Um, we have a lot of things coming, a lot of a lot of big plans in the future, and that will be a light setup as part of that. So great presentation. Thank you. Appreciate it. Helpful review. Thank you. Glad you guys got a lot of uh, insight out of this. So just join anyway. You can save this live. I feel like I lift. I missed all this info behind you. Yeah, um, we will definitely uh, do a lot or save this live, guys. It's going to be saved. All of the whiteboard Wednesday guys are saved on my reels. So just go to my reels. There's like four or five other topics. We've done like child investing. We've done HSAs. We've done um, how to manage your cash flow. We've done um, how to use your financial statements cohesively together. So we've talked on a lot of topics. I think this is our fifth one or sixth one, which is obviously we talked about investment allocations tonight. Um, I was going to do tax loss harvesting here soon. Um, I almost did that one tonight, but I decided not to. Um, do you see many people transitioning to ETFs now that you can buy partials? Yes. So good question, good comment, um, and good question. So yeah, a lot of people are switching to ETFs. I've, I've talked in the past. I think I have a, um, I'm going to share this, uh, news with you guys. Let me see. Where's, where's it at? Here we, uh, no, that's my bad. My bad. Um, hey, FYI, since I have that up anyway, there's a webinar coming up for being recession proof. So go check that out. It's my link in my bio. Um, but that was not what I was trying to share. I promise. Um, there was another one with a red, where's it at? Where's it at? I can't find it. Maybe I deleted it. I'm sorry. Um, no, here it is. Here it is. And of course you can't see the whole thing. Okay. Anyways, it's saying Vanguard update is fractional buys are now available. So you're able to buy fractional ETFs. The problem is you can't automate these. So that's why I say secondly. But when the time comes, I'm going to be switching this. These are not taxable events. So so what this means is if you have, in particular, um, an index fund through Vanguard and it's VTSAX and you want to switch to VTI because now they offer the um, – these fractional shares on an automated buy, you're able to do that. So until they let the automation happen, I'm not going to change that because it doesn't make sense, but I will switch to that. Um, there, I've talked about this on Twitter and Instagram. I've, I've said why I'm going to do that. So I'm not going to get into details to that. Um, but the reason or the, the purpose of doing that is it's ultimately cheaper. Um, the investment like plan has not changed. There's nothing that I've changed about the investment plan. Everything's remaining the same. But it's just easier from um, – it's cheaper from a, uh, a cost perspective. So it makes a lot of sense. So a lot of people are transitioning to this. I know for a fact into ETFs. There's a lot of ETF inflow in general um, over the last you know, five, ten years. So I think that's going to continue to be the case. Um, but don't do it. Don't be switching your portfolio because the, the market's down. Like Unless you're in like crap stocks like AMC and G GameStop and you're trying to like start new and start fresh. Um, and actually get a plan together. 
Um, are there any issues with remaining aggressive despite your age? Um, there's not. You just have to be familiar with like what could the downside of that, right? So there's no problem with it. Um, you just, I mean, if you're trying to retire and you're super aggressive at 63 years old and you want to retire at 64 and the market downturns, like you don't want to be in a position where you lose 30% of your portfolio value and then you have to work extra couple years. So um, you do have to be reallocate, you know, especially as you get older and closer to those, those dates of uh, withdrawal. Um, my Vanguard 401k won't let me pick anything outside of a target date fund and it's annoying. Um, the only, so you can select the, you might only have those options, like just target date funds. Um, every employer is going to be different. Whatever the employer you, you're working for bought as far as the 401k package is what you have options to. It will let you select or change your investments. Like that's a hundred percent. Um, it will do that. It will, it will let you, but your, your employer might've just bought a set of target date funds and kept it really simple. So I don't know what your employer did. But you can definitely you can definitely edit that. Um, good time to switch a rollover IRA to a Roth IRA with market down. Good question and good comment. Yes, hundred percent. So if you guys have a rollover and you're wanting to take it to Roth and you're going to therefore pay the taxes on that conversion, whenever the market's down is a good time to take advantage of that because you pay less taxes on that conversion. There's less income that you've transferred, so um, you really transfer the amount of shares that are the same, but at a lower amount, and therefore you don't get taxed on that. And that's a pretty good pretty good benefit. So um, if you can take advantage of a down market and do a rollover, it makes a lot of sense. Um, but make sure that was kind of the plan and you were waiting for that time. Um, how does the age of the ETF impact your decision on whether to invest in it? How does the age of the ETF? Um, I think what you mean is like when like a new ETF comes to market or whatever. Um, so there's a, my book guys talks about a lot of this like in detail. Like I can't really go into everything here. But like I have like 10 different things I'm looking at when I'm assessing like an investment like from an uh, index fund or ETF perspective and like the, the factors I'm looking at. Age is definitely relevant in that conversation, but it's definitely not everything because if you are – if you know what you the what it is, like if it's a brand new S&P 500 fund, like it's not going to scare me. It's it, The age is irrelevant. But if it's like something that's more targeted or uh, niche, I would definitely be – Age would play a considerable factor in that. All right. Um, and, and also for the rollover, guys, I have a free rollover service in my link in my bio. Um, so go check that out. If you're trying to roll over old 401ks or anything like that, go check that link out. It does everything for you and it takes care of you. Um, you don't have to do any of the work. Uh, should I roll over my 401k to a Roth or an index fund? Um, 35 years old with a few thousand. Okay. So kind of back to the initial conversation, guys, is this question in particular, I'm going to pick on it, but with all due respect, okay? When you say, do I roll this to an index fund or an account? Remember, the very thing, the big thing right here, allocations are within accounts, okay? So that doesn't really tell me much. What I will gather from that, what I assume from that is, should I take that to a taxable brokerage account or should I take that to... um, what was the other option? Um, your Roth, which again, I've had a presentation. Roth does not necessarily make sense either because a Roth could be a 401k as well. So I'm assuming you're taking this from a Roth IRA or from a 401k to either a Roth IRA or a taxable brokerage account. But that question needs to be kind of restated in a different way because this could drastically change your tax. And I, I'm not, I don't mean that to pick on you. But I mean, I've talked about that a lot because your tax consequence based on what I'm saying is the assumptions I'm making right here. So do not take this – like maybe DM me after the fact so we can really talk about this um, because I don't want to put you in a bad position from a tax perspective. A 401k can be traditional or Roth. So I'm assuming you have a traditional 401k and you're asking should I take it to a Roth IRA or a taxable brokerage. You would take it to a rollover IRA first. And then you would have the option to roll or convert that rollover to a Roth and therefore pay taxes. If you took it to the rollover, there's no tax. Um, if you took it to an index fund from the 401k, then there's tax plus penalty. And I would not, I would definitely not do that. Um, so definitely don't do the, to the index fund or the brokerage account unless you want to pay the penalty for whatever reason, like 35% in total. Um, but like I would probably take it to the forum from the 401k 
to the rollover IRA and then ultimately make a decision on that conversion if it makes sense from a tax perspective. The other option would be keeping it in a 401k, your old 401k, or which I wouldn't do, um, or I would roll it to your current employer's 401k, assuming their options are pretty good. And um, you could consider the rule 55 down the road. So that might make a sense as well, depending on what your, what your goals are. Um, the title of my book, guys, is uh, Investing 101. So you guys can find that in my link in my bio. It's under financial gifts for you. I also have a free, um, a free product, guys, index investing, um, really deep diving, like a 30 minute, like little mini presentation for you guys. Totally free of charge. It's in my link in my bio under financial gifts. Um, go to the very bottom and you'll see that free. Um, you can watch that 30 minute presentation on like, especially right now with the market, the way it's at, it will give you a lot of confidence. Um, I'll definitely find your, try to find your book. Yeah, guys, don't, don't try to find the book. The book is in my link in my bio, financial gifts, uh, investing one one Uh, let me know if you can't find it. Uh, but yeah, it's really good, straightforward guys, 75, 80 pages or whatever. And it just gets to, it gets down to the, the nitty gritty of everything. Yes, uh, path of potential. I was not picking on you at all, man. Um, for real, I, w- I I just get these questions a lot, and I don't want somebody to make a the wrong move because they've asked the wrong way. And so I want to make sure the education behind the the topics right because like that decision for real could like cost you like five. I mean, depending on the amounts, obviously. Like, let's just say it could cost you five thousand, ten thousand dollars. Like, if you had too much money or a lot of money in that four hundred one k, and you're like putting it into an index fund in a brokerage account that could like screw you over. So if I blindly just went and answered that question, um, I feel like I would be pretty liable for that. Um, do you think it's tax effective to invest in the domestic markets? Um, I don't know what you mean by why, why would the, the location would be necessarily, um, from a tax perspective, are you referring to account, a specific account magnet money? Um, would you suggest someone buying option leaps for your IRA? Absolutely not. Um, Dre, you know that. <laughs> um, I'm not touching any options, guys, personally. There's nothing wrong with them, but you know my, you know my stance on that. Um, just gotten some serious I-bonds, 9.62 for the next 12 months. It's actually for the next six months. It resets every every six months, so um, that's not guaranteed. I also would not invest in an I-bond, guys. Um, I, have a, I have a YouTube video on I-bonds, what I think about them, the details about them. It could make a lot of sense for short-term savings. I would not be investing in I-bonds personally. Tommy, stop asking me. <laughs> we have an offline conversation, guys, um, which why, is why I said that. Uh, I love the direct truth. That's what what's valuable. I appreciate it. Yeah, man, Path of Potential, I can help you out in the DMs, man, if, if we get some more detail behind that. Um, and for sure. What's up, Sugar Lumps? What's up, cash flow? Um, what's my stance on options overall? Um, guys, the reality is options aren't going to make you win. Um, sure, could you make some quick money? Options are gambling. They are. I don't care what anyone says. I don't care what chart you you show me. The The idea of options is no different than me playing fantasy football and saying, with all of this data I put together and all these algorithms I put together, I think it's going to, you know, uh, Justin uh, or... Tim Tebow, or no, that's a horrible example. Um, Patrick Mahomes is going to go for 31 points. Like, that's what I'm ultimately deciding there. So, no, I don't like options. Um, am I totally against the concept of them? No. But for the average person, like I tweeted uh, the other day, is like the reality is like, here, right here. This is the problem with trading in general and options in general is like 90% of traders are going to lose money. That's a fact. That's a fact. A hundred percent think they're the exception. So there's ten percent probably are right, but uh, and they probably are the exception. But most of those people aren't going to make money. The ten percent that make money, guys, don't actually make real money. Only one percent of people actually make real money when it comes to trading. Um, you're spending a countless number of hours to learn a very low ROI skill. Instead, you could be spending all that time actively earning money in a job that guarantees and trades for your time because eventually you'll flip the script and you'll use the active income to fund your good low cost index funds and ETFs to then retire early, which is ultimately what your goal is here. Um, Many think trading is investing. It's not. There's totally two different things. And the 10% that win usually are spending billions of dollars in algorithms on Wall Street. So that's a little reason. That's kind of a little more insight into why I don't like it. I follow the math. I follow the statistics and it just doesn't matter. It doesn't add up. Um, VIX question mark. Uh, what about the VIX? Aloha. What's up, Bama? 
Uh, thoughts on VT, VT Sacks and Chill? I think VT Sacks and Chill is a pretty good, pretty good route. Um, you can't go wrong with it. Um, the only thing is, like we talked about earlier, you have to understand the volatility that comes with 100% into the U.S. market. So um, as long as you're okay with the downfall that's happening right now of 23%, which is normal, um, I talk about it all the time as to why it's not a big deal, you should be fine. Um, but again, it depends on your goals and stuff like that. Um, what are my thoughts on purchasing luxury handbags like Chanel as an investment? Uh, I would not ever consider that an investment or watches or jewelry. I understand they retain their value, but if you're getting that guys, you're not, let's be honest, you're not buying that as an investment. You're buying that to, for yourself or for other reasons or whatever. Just, just admit, um, (laughs) just like be real. It's cool. Like you might be able to sell it at a later date, but the reality is like, it might get like trash. It might fall in the rain. uh, A dog might bite it. You know, it's a thing. So, I'm not going to invest or use that as a, an investment. Um, I think we just call a spade a spade. So zero sum game, exactly, Connor. So the market is a it's a zero sum game at the end of the day. So you you might win, you might lose, but at the end of the day, it's a zero sum game. Um, index and chill, yes. Uh, Tim Tebow, yes. I, that was a bad example. Sorry. Uh, Long term in puppies, I I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I have no idea, Rob. Uh, I, I don't know if you were talking about like breeding, but that's not my specialty. Um, handbags aren't an investment. Yeah. I think a lot of times guys like, like I've seen this, this take with like Lamborghinis and stuff like, well, it will retain its value and like, everyone's going to stop and talk to me and therefore I might have a business deal out of it. Like, sure. That stuff might happen, but that's not why you're buying it. So, um, just buy it because you're going to buy it for that, whatever, for the usage of that item. So it's cool. Like there's nothing wrong with it. Just stop like trying to make it seem like a great, great idea. Um, okay. So cash flow is the real deal guys. Like he's my boy. Um, he's somebody that I, I truly trust when it comes to data, the data, I reckon 99% of people lose money trading options and he trades. Um, don't do it unless you're hundred percent wanting to. Yeah. You have to be like all in on trading and it has to be like consuming. Like that's gotta be you. Like you gotta really, you can't be waking up like, Every once in a while, going to work in the car, doing a quick trade with like Robin Hood, like that's just not going to work. Um, thoughts on REITs? Um, do, don't own any of my portfolio worth adding, and do they provide legit diversification? Um, yeah, REITs are fantastic. Um, REITs guys have been the top performing asset class over the last twenty years, two thousand one to two thousand twenty. That is, um, so REITs have been an excellent option. I think it can make a lot of sense. Um, Make sure REITs are going into retirement accounts versus a taxable account due to the tax impact of those uh, the unqualified dividends that you're receiving. So 90% of those are are paid out. So or from a from a REIT. So if those are in a taxable account, those are that's a high tax consequence. Almost at 100 in dividends ain't much, but it's honest. That's dude. That's awesome. Any any growth, anything you guys start investing in, it doesn't matter. The, the key guys is to invest and to educate and to build upon that. If you, inv- if you, if you, um, keep working your investment muscle, just like you'd be lifting, lifting weights in the gym, eventually that's going to pick up. Eventually you're going to, um, you're going to grow and you're going to get better and stronger and stuff like that. Same with investing. Don't be discouraged. If you have $2, $5, $100, $200, just put it in, just set up an automation. You know, the skill, you know, you've replicated this so many times that when you get that raise, you can turn, turn that to 250 and 500 and 1,000 and 10,000 and 100,000. Like that's the reality of it. If you can't handle $100,000, you're not going to be able to handle a million. Um, same thing with like 50,000. If you can't handle 50, you're not going to be able to hand, uh, handle 100,000 all of a sudden. You have to put these investing in financial concepts in place no matter your income. Your income's irrelevant. Your I- income is speed and it's going to make a difference. I wouldn't say irrelevant, but as far as like the practices and principles, it does not matter what your income is. You have to begin at any point in time, at any number, um, and at any age. Um, what's my take on holding? Uh, but but he spent twenty k on a watch. Um, oh, I don't I don't know about that. I'm not gonna get into that conversation. Um, what's your take on holding crypto? Um, I like crypto a lot, guys. Um, but again, I do a very small allocation. It's it's part of my asset diversification. Let me show you real fast. If you guys. If you guys get into crypto and I, I 
say this every time. So some of you guys might have seen this. Get this, uh, a Ledger Nano X. You have to get this. This is like a USB. Um, this is cold storage. So this is going to protect you in the case of any like um, spam or scams that have been happening on like the the uh, like finances and things of that nature. So don't get yourself in trouble if you get into crypto. Keep it small. Don't. This is not a gamble. This is a legitimate asset class, in my opinion, um, long term that could make a lot of sense. It's a it's a very highly speculative asset, so you have to understand the um, that behind it. I have a crypto beginner's guide. If you want to get started in crypto, um, go download my crypto the free crypto starter or uh, checklist or whatever. I recommend most people not getting into crypto because they haven't checked off all the boxes. Um, so be careful with that. Uh, it's a, it's a two fund portfolio with total world market and VT and BDNDL. We cra- crazy for not being diversified enough. Um, no man, Rhett, that's a, it's actually exactly the, uh, the two fund I, I answered here. This is the ETF version, but it was VTWX and, uh, BBTLX or whatever. So no, I think it's, that's a great, great model. Um, what do I know about I bonds? I did a whole entire YouTube video, Dre. So check out that YouTube video, man. I break out I bonds, the pros, the cons, the usage for them, and everything like that. Um, what's my percentage to net of net worth allocated to crypto? One percent. So of investable assets, I think I'm at like two percent. But of um, total net worth, which I'm very transparent about, um, I'm about to hit millionaire status any any day. So. I went. I was at nine hundred eighty six thousand guys, and last week it dropped from nine eighty six to nine forty three. Again, um, I just I have a couple more months to hit it by thirty. So my goal is to hit millionaire status by thirty. I think I, I'm going to do it. Um, I had a post the other day talking about exactly the details. I'm going to show you guys the very. Um, I'm going to give you guys as much insight into my millionaire journey as possible. But yeah, by thirty years old, I'm hitting millionaire status, doing all of the stuff I talk about, fundamental stuff. And um, we were at 986. We were at $14,000 short last week. And uh, it obviously the market took a little tumble. So we're down to 943 right now. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. Again, net worth is not that important, but it's a pretty big milestone to hit millionaire status. So I'm pretty excited. Um, probably not going to celebrate, I'll be honest. Um, but we'll, it's going to be pretty cool. Um, VT, FTX is buying Voyager. Um, yeah, but so for, for crypto, guys, I... Like the whole point of bringing that up was about one percent of that number. So let's just say roughly about nine to ten thousand in crypto in total. Um, so pretty small allocation is in relation to the nine hundred and eighty six thousand dollars net worth. Like one percent crypto, not a lot of money, but it's all housed on this. Um, so I don't get in, myself in trouble. Um, you all keep up with great content. And it's great and profitable to use. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, guys, my goal is to continue to give you guys good, actionable, practical stuff. The stuff I talk about, it's not just random. Like, it's all of the stuff that I personally, let me rephrase that in a second, Tommy, but it's all the stuff I've used to get millionaire status by 30. There's nothing crazy about what I do. It's fundamental, it's foundational, and Budget Dog Academy has it all. So, these types of presentations are a nightly occurrence in Budget Dog Academy for a good reason. You have everything you need in that academy, um, and that's my goal. So I saw Brianna join. She's in the in the um, in the live right now. She just joined my academy today. So first day in the academy today, and um, she's gonna get rolling here soon. But guys, Budget Dog Academy is going to teach you all these things. Like it's going to knock. It will guarantee. It's not gonna guarantee. I can't guarantee anything because I can't guarantee you show up. But I can guarantee if you show up and if you put in the work, you will become a millionaire with time. So I'm not saying you're going to become a millionaire tomorrow. I'm not saying um, it's the easiest thing in the world to do, but I will. Pro- and Natalie, or uh, yeah, um, I have multiple other people in here right now. So um, there's a lot of people in here as part of Budget Dog Academy. They can speak on it. The Academy's fire. So I can't guarantee anybody's success. I never will do that. But what I can say is the average student is phenomenal results. The average student gets access to what I'm talking about on Whiteboard Wednesday in great detail with templates, with exact, you know, handouts, with everything. Um, And if you want to build wealth, it's a decision. I know that offends some people and I don't mean to offend anybody by saying that. Um, I understand we all come from different backgrounds. We all have different circumstances. But at the end of the day, you can make a decision to build wealth and that should be empowering. And that's my goal behind when I say that is 
I have I say that with good intention. You get to you get to decide if you want to build wealth. It's just a matter of patience, discipline, and education. Um, and so the more education you have, the the more access you have to other individuals doing that. You put yourself in a supportive community. Like you're gonna win with money. I promise you that. Um, and all the people, the the non believers out there, are saying, "I don't know Excel, or I don't believe in myself, or I don't make enough money." Like that's just a load of BS. And that's a good thing to uh, to realize. Like once you realize that, you're gonna be able to build wealth. Like I promise you, guys. I started off not making a lot of money. Like I wasn't making a ton of money, but I put these things in place and I ma- I maximized my muscle for when I made started making actually legitimate money. Um, and my wife and I climbed out of three hundred and four thousand dollars of debt in five years. Um, because we just put these things, these principles in place and they work. They're foundational. They're fundamental. The problem where people lose is it takes time. It's not going to, it's not trading. It's not getting rich quick and it's going to take time. And most people aren't going to stick with it. That's just the reality. I'm not naive. So I do everything possible within the academy that people commit to and make an investment in to, I hire a behavioral psychologist to work on the behavior side of things because that's a huge impact of it. Um, but also I tried to do everything possible. I stay up late at night to think about this stuff to like give those people that decide to join my students that decide to join that to make sure that they succeed because that's what I want you, you know, check-ins and all these types of different things I have um, set in there. So it's a decision, guys, and you guys can all build um, immense wealth. I, I promise you. I'm just showing you practical tips. I'm not doing anything crazy. I'm not like trading or um, posting huge gains on like a, some options trade or something like that. I'm not saying it doesn't work. I'm not saying you can't do it, but like the reality is, like if you really want to build a sustainable model that works long term, that you can live a happy life, like you want to spend time with your family, um, just just set it up. Just just do it once and for all, and, and get the get the things in place. Um, my life got easier when I realized all my biggest problems historically have been self-imposed on the life on the come up now though. That's awesome, Chris. Uh, so yes, I mean, that's how I, that's how I've always thought guys. Um, did I think I was going to be, uh, delivered a, a baby with Dervais syndrome as my first kid? No, absolutely not. Am I going to sit here and complain about it and cry about it and whine about it? Absolutely not. We're going to make the best of it. We're going to make it work. Right? So it's it's just it's whatever situation you're in it does not matter like you just have to have the belief that you can take that next step and once you take that next step it's going to be enlightening especially when you see that first ounce of success because you're going to realize you did that not the government not your teacher not your parents not your friends not your colleagues you made that success happen and when you see that happen all of a sudden you're going to like be wow i made that happen all of a sudden your brain gets a lot bigger and you start thinking about bigger ideas and bigger goals and boom, you start seeing extreme success. That's how our, our stuff happened. When we first started, we paid off one bed. It was a $75 payment per month and we were ecstatic about it, but we, we didn't believe we could do it. We were, I was like, holy shit, we have $304,000 of debt. Man, this is going to be a 15, 20 year journey. I don't even know what to do. And then we just paid off that bed. I remember specifically, I was sitting, we were doing our porch in the back. Um, I walk in, I said, Aaron, we're paying off the bed right, right this second. We went in, I made an automatic payment, we paid it off, and boom. And then like five years later, we paid off our freaking house, like by 29 years old. So um, that did not start like that. I drove by, actually, in fact, um, I took a picture today when I drove by. This is the church I was sitting on when I was building Budget Dog. Those steps right there were where I took my first picture or I posted my first post three years ago um, on Budge Dog. I had a hard hat on. I was a CPA at the time. I was working at Deloitte. And I said, you know what? Enough's enough. I need to get out of debt. How am I going to do this? I'm going to work side jobs on the weekends. So on the weekends and when I was on PTO, I went to this church and I demoed it. I had a hard hat and everything. And I made $12 an hour under the table. $12 an hour under the table. Okay? That was the reality of where I started. But now everyone sees, oh my God, he's hitting millionaire status by 30 and everyone's like, oh, he's just lucky. He's just privileged. He's just all these bullshit like excuses to make myself feel better. And like, that's not what happened. That's not what happened. So that's just the, that's just the real guys. That's what, that's, that's what can happen. That's what you guys can do in your life to change your life. Um, it's just a matter of time for real. All right, guys. Um, it looks like I answered all the questions. Um, I love DCA. Yeah, DCA is um, the way to go. Um, do download that free presentation, guys, in my link in my bio. Link in my bio um, 
financial gifts for you at the very, very bottom. You can download a free presentation, especially with the markets where they're at right now. I highly recommend you guys to go check that out because I think it's going to help a lot of people in this down market capitalize an opportunity. So um, really, really like guys, put yourself in the position of, of winning. Okay. Put yourself, you know, you're going to capitalize in these markets. Like the market is, the opportunity is right in front of you. Like the markets have already dipped and we haven't even hit the bad points yet because the job markets are so strong. So wait till a year goes by and the job markets get dicey. The self-fulfilling prophecy that everyone wants this recession to come is going to happen and it's going to come and people are going to lose their job and it's going to be a year of bad markets and people are going to lose their freaking mind and you're going to be following me and you're going to be in my Budget Dog Academy and you're going to be capitalizing on all of the opportunity right in front of us. This is going to happen. It's just the reality. Um, it's we're, we're due for this. And if you're not positioned from a cash position or cash flow position, like this is your opportunity. Like I don't know how many times I'm going to have to say that to get it through to every single 120,000 of my followers, but I'm trying to every day for good reason because on the opposite, on let's say 2024 or 2025, we're going to look back and we're going to say 2023 was probably a pretty ugly year. I might be wrong, but I might be wrong. So I think we're going to look back and say 2023, 2022, and 2023 were pretty ugly years. The people in 2024 are either going to be extremely wealthy or way worse off. So the gap is going to widen. And if you position yourself right this second before it gets any worse, you're going to be fine. If you wait, if you mess around and you think this isn't that serious and you know, you're going to see another, two, not a 2008 in the sense of 2008, but you're going to see another 2008 where people lose their jobs and freak out and sell and make really poor decisions and it's going to crush themselves. So I'm going to leave it like this. Um, guys, next, um, let's see, where's this at? So next Tuesday, I'm doing a recession proof, three steps to prepare for a recession. Um, Tuesday, October 4th at 8.30, limited 500 people. Go into my link in my bio. Um, join this. Join this. I'm going to show you, share you guys a very, very personal story of my, my family in 2008 and how we handled that. Um, where uh, I'm, I'm going to wait till you guys join the, join the, uh, the, the uh, webinar. But I'm going to share a really, really personal story of 2008 and how my, how my family was impacted by that. So make sure you guys join the webinar. Um, this is Whiteboard Wednesday. Signing off, guys. If you guys have any other topics, let me know. Um, but I will be doing another Whiteboard Wednesday next, 8, uh, next Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Reach out, guys. If you guys have any questions, always feel free to DM me.